Okay. All right, welcome back. Lecture six, we're on week two, Friday. Um, what we want to do today is we want to finish up this method of dominant balance, and then we also want to get a start on the local bifurcations theory. Uh, one thing I'll mention is about the problem set. Most, uh, actually a good chunk of you did hand in problem sets. If you want to hand in problem sets in future weeks for feedback, then you can just go to the Moodle course and it's, there's a hand in now. Uh, you'll see the version of Moodle that I have. Uh, there is now a hand in under this problem set here for your problem set number two. So uh, the other thing that I decide to do, just because it syncs up a little bit nicely with the way that I'm doing the timing, is I've extended the hand in time for this problem set two to Friday. So it kind of makes sense. Every Friday I'll talk about the next problem set and then it'll be due the following Friday. Otherwise, it's a bit tight. Um, it's a bit tight with the Wednesday deadline. Okay, again, we'll kind of see how it goes. Um, but I think the first one worked out quite well and we have yet to get feedback uh, back to you. The second thing I'll mention is that the bulletin board, people are starting to post questions to that and I do check that every couple, I, mean, I check it whenever I remember to check it. Um, and there are some good questions here that I've responded to, one of which I'll, I hope to get to today. And then finally, the lecture notes are, as I mentioned on Wednesday's uh, course, the lecture notes for chapters five and six are, there up, uh, are now up, and then also problem set two. Now, the, the bulletin, one of the bulletin board questions made me realize that problem set two were actually, um, question number one here, you don't actually, we haven't actually covered some of the material for question number one, style node bifurcation and period doubling bifurcation here. And so I'm hoping to push you through today to know, you know, kind of vaguely how you do this question number one, but we might have to finish it up on Monday. And that's also one of the reasons why I extended the deadline to Friday. But the, these questions, questions three and four, you are ready to do. These are the series um, analysis questions um, that we've been doing on the, Monday and, on the Monday and Wednesday lecture. Okay. All right, let's get back to... Uh, Let's get back to this question that we didn't quite finish up last time on the cubic equation. The idea was that we had this cubic equation with this parameter mu, and we were interested in basically solving for the roots of this cubic equation or approximating the roots when mu is a small number. And we did this with the method of dominant balance, or at least we got the basic idea with the method of dominant balance. We said as the first possible balance, if mu is a small number, you get to ignore this one and so it's 2 balancing 3, and if I just balance 2 with 3, I get x is, a, is approximately 1, or x tilde is 1. Okay? And you can then verify that this is a consistent balance because 1 is small under that approximation. If x is tilde 1, then 1 is, is tilde mu, and mu is a small number, so it can be neglected. But this doesn't get you all three roots, and the error in the logic happens from the fact that x might be a big number, and if x is a big number, then 1 is no longer negligible, and so it's sensible to balance 1 and 2 together, because 2 will be obviously bigger than 3. And remember, when, I, when we say things like bigger than or less than, uh, we're, we're talking about absolute magnitude, right? Because we're talking about a balance of terms rather than the sign. So we don't care about signs, we just say the magnitude of x. So if 1 balances 2, then I have mu times x cubed balancing x, and that tells me if I discard the root around 0, which I get to discard because I've assumed that x is large, that x is then like plus or minus 1 over root mu. So this is a, what we call a leading order approximation, a first approximation to the roots of this cubic. And at the very end of that Wednesday class, I began setting up the framework for how you find the higher order approximations of this root here. I said, you're going to write this as a series expansion in powers of mu and then solve order by order. Okay? And then I left off saying that I was going to explain to you how you get the higher order approximations of this, uh, of this root. Okay, let's, let's do that. So to get the higher order approximations of the root around infinity, the trick is that you want to rescale the problem, okay? Uh, 
So to find the approximation around plus or minus infinity. Actually, before I do that, let me show you the picture of the cubic, and then you, again, you get a better intuition uh, for what's going on. So let's just switch here. OK. So firstly, on, uh, this is a little MATLAB script that all it does is that it's going to plot these cubic equations, okay? And it's going to plot, plot it for different values of mu. So that's what you see on this line 6 of the code. You're going to go from mu is 1, 0 0.5, 0 0.3. These are just somewhat random values that I chose that get smaller and smaller. So the smallest one is 0 0.01. And then it just does a bunch of plot commands. And this is the picture that results. So if you look at this picture on the left here, then, okay, what do you see? Well, firstly, this yellow curve here, the yellow curve um, where my mouse is, this is for the largest value of mu. So when mu is 1, you have this yellow curve. And then as mu gets smaller and smaller, as mu gets smaller and smaller, uh, you, you start to go from yellow to purple to green to blue to red to blue to red to yellow. Okay, and so what, what are you noticing? Well, first of all, from this picture here, if mu is sufficiently small, there are three roots in this equation. That's the first realization that you have, right? So um, when mu is a bit too large, then you don't have the three roots, but if mu is sufficiently small, you have three intersections. So this red curve, for instance, intersects at this negative point, intersects somewhere near the origin, and then at the positive point. The second thing you'll notice is that one of the roots will then tend towards, if I can zoom in to this in this picture here, one of the roots of the three will tend towards one. I have a I'm having a great deal of trouble with my MATLAB. Okay, here we are. So I've now zoomed in near one, and you're seeing the, from the yellow, the purple, the green, the blue, the red, and so forth. So you see these intersections here, they're moving towards the left, and they get closer and closer to one. So this was our approximation for four. And by going to higher order, by developing more terms in the approximation, you get better and better approximations to where that root is, assuming that mu is not exactly at zero. If it's exactly at zero, then of course the intersection is at one. But then there are two roots, the left one and the right one, which tend to infinity, right? So that's what I mean by you have to rescale around infinity. You have to basically take the cubic polynomial that you have, and then scale the x-coordinate so that the root, which tends to infinity as mu tends to zero, is then no longer at infinity. Okay, let me show you how that's done. So I'm going to set little x to be big X over root mu. And if I do this rescaling here, then the trick is then that the root in terms of big X is then at plus or minus one approximately, because I know that the root in little x was plus or minus one over root mu. So you stick this scaling into the equation, and then you get mu here, and then this will be the cube of that, so that's mu to the minus three halves times big X cubed minus mu to the minus one half times big X plus one is equal to zero. And you'll know that you've done it right, because if you simplify this, that gets you a mu to the minus one half, you have a mu to the minus one half, and I multiply everything by a mu to the minus, to the one, to the minus one, sorry. I multiply everything with a mu to the one half, and that gets me an x cubed minus an x plus mu to the one half is equal to zero. And I know I've done it right, you see, because then one and two are now in balance, and three is smaller than one and two, okay? You haven't really done anything different in this problem. You've just rescaled that variable. It's equivalent to basically looking at the graph, and you notice that the roots are going off to minus and positive infinity. And so what you do is that you just take a step away. This is like stepping away from the graph. You walk away or zoom out of the graph. And if you zoom out enough, 
because this factor is very small, if you zoom out enough, then basically the roots are, are, are located in a fixed place. That's the idea. Okay, so now you're going to then set, it's the same procedure as before, you're going to do a approximation in powers. Now the power that you need to go up here is mu to the one half. Okay, and I, I've, I've kind of revisited this question. I'm, I'm anticipating that everyone always has this question. How do I you know that it goes up in mu to the one half? Well, you kind of know by the structure of how it looks. Usually the, uh, the number that appears as an error in the approximation is the, exactly the number that sh it should go up in. If you didn't do the right thing and you said, well, I'm going to put mu up in powers of one, it's not going to work, and you end up with an inconsistency um, at the order of mu to the one half. Basically, if you went up in powers of mu instead of mu to the one half, you'd end up with an unbalanced equation at this mu to the one half, and you couldn't go any further. And so then you go back and you say, well, I should have gone up in mu to the one half. Now, if you went up with mu to the one quarter, then what you would find is that the first equation that you solve, you get zero, and then it skips to the second. Okay, so because you don't have that much experience, just take it on faith that this, this number, the power of this number, usually is the order in which you progress. And the more you do these equations, the more practice you get, the more experience um, you'll get, and, 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 and you'll, be able, you'll be able to tell. Okay, so I stick this into the equation, and then I expand everything. So let's just do that here. I have an x naught. We're going to get two terms. That's a cube minus x naught plus mu to the one half x one plus dot dot dot, and then uh, plus mu times, sorry, plus mu to the one half. Here we are. Is equal to zero. And as usual, you need to expand this cubic, and it's good to know that um, the binomial theorem when you expand the cubic, but this will be an x naught cubed plus 3 x naught squared mu to the 1 half x1 plus dot 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 minus uh, the x naught plus mu to the 1 half x1 plus dot 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 plus mu to the one-half is equal to zero. Right? Okay, and then you group everything, and then you just order everything in powers of, of mu, in increasing powers of mu. Okay, let me erase this. Oh no. By the way, we've used this trick a few times. I'll just state it explicitly so you know the trick. So if, if I have something like uh, x naught plus epsilon x1 plus dot 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 to the power of n, then the leading term will always be an x naught to the n. And then this will be an n x naught to the n minus 1 times epsilon x1 plus dot dot dot. OK? If you want to do this, uh, if you want to see how this relates to the previous notes we had, you can factor out the x naught here. You factor out the x naught, and you have in brackets a one plus epsilon x one over x naught plus dot 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 to the n. And you'll notice that in one of the lectures we gave the formula to this expansion here. So it's the same trick. So you, when you use this expansion, and then you multiply by this x naught. This is an x naught to the n. I'm sorry. Once you, uh, once you re-multiply the x naught back in, you'll end up with this expansion. So it's just the trick of, of doing the binomial expansion. In this course, you don't really have to worry too much about, you know, you, as long as you get two terms. I'll never really ask for anything beyond that. OK, so I group everything together. I group the order 1 stuff together. Then I group the order mu stuff together. So the constant ones with no mu's in front, I have an x naught cubed, and I've got an x naught here. So I have an x naught cubed minus x naught is equal to 0. OK, now uh, if I solve this, I have x naught equal to 0 or 
x naught is equal to plus or minus 1. This, by the way, you discard because the assumption here is that you're trying to solve for the ones uh, where x naught is not 0. Right? If you're a bit confused, well, why, do we, why do you get 0 here? This 0 is effectively like walking away from the graph. You've now walked away from the graph. The two roots which were at minus infinity and positive infinity are now pinned at plus or minus 1. And the root that was previously at minus 1 looks a lot like it's at the origin. Right? So you have that, think of that cubic equation and thinking, think about walking far away from the graph. And when you walk far away, the root that's previously at 1 now looks a lot like it's at the origin. That's the basic idea. But this one here you discard. You don't really discard it, it's just found in the previous analysis. Okay, then you go to order mu to the one half and you get all your mu to the one half terms. You have a 3x naught squared x1 and you've got a minus x1 and then you've got a 1 here. And you solve that equation there. So that gives you x1 is equal to 1 over uh, 1 minus 3 x naught squared. And x naught squared is either plus or minus 1, so that's either, that's just basically 1 over 1 minus 3, so that's minus a half. And there you are. So we've developed the two-term approximation. And you can understand, or at least you can see that if you want to go to higher order, you could do it. It gets a little bit harder because you have to start expanding this one to more terms. But it could be done. And then you can go to any desired accuracy and develop better and better approximations. OK? So altogether, let's, uh, altogether what have you concluded? Let's just do that here. And uh, no, we'll do it down here. So you've concluded that x is uh, plus or minus 1 uh, minus 1 half mu to the 1 half plus dot dot dot. Okay? And then you go back to the original little x coordinate, and the little x coordinate is just um, little x is big X over root mu. So it's plus or minus 1 over root mu minus 1 half. Plus dot, dot, dot. Okay, so so far we have two approximations to the problem. We've got this one here, and we've also got the one at one. So x twiddles one, and I don't remember what was the next term, but you, we might we we might have done it on the Wednesday. I think we did it on the Wednesday. All right. Okay, so let's just do a little brief experiment and, and, and confirm that this result was right. So in this graph here, in addition to just plotting the curves, I also have this command here, r is equal to roots. And in MATLAB, this roots command finds the roots of the polynomial with mu being the highest coefficient, mu times x cubed, 0 times x squared, minus x plus 1. And I simply collect these roots as I'm putting in different values of mu. And this is the main table that results, OK? So what you see in this table, now, um, firstly, because of the way, you'll notice that the roots in the picture that I've just minimized, uh, sometimes you don't have roots, right? When mu is small enough, then you do have three roots. But when you don't, then they're complex. So just for uh, the sake of, of, of the display, I've only taken the real part. So you want to ignore some of these numbers initially because they might be complex valued. But when mu is small enough, mu is on the first column here. So mu starts off at 1, then 0 0.5, then 0 0.3, then 0 0.1, and so forth and so on. You'll notice that the central root here is tending towards 1. Right? That was the approximation. And if you wanted to, you go back to our Wednesday note and find the next term that we found. And you'll be able to see whether, how close that next term is to this number for instance, okay? But let's look at the, the first and the third root. So I know that as the, the approximation tells me that the first and the third root is roughly around plus or minus 1 over root mu. So when mu is at 0.01, that works out to be, it should be roughly around minus 10 and plus 10. And that's exactly what you're seeing here. One root near minus 10, one root plus 10. 
oh, we can do better than that, right? We can do that better than that because look at our approximation. Not only did we approximate that it was at plus or minus 1 over root 10, uh, sorry, 1 over root 0 0.01 or 10, plus or minus 10, but there's an error. The next term is around minus a half. So you should subtract minus a half. So you should subtract a half from your approximation of the roots. And let's go back to these numbers. And oh, I just realized that my face is in the way here, eh? So I'm going to move this over to the right. So uh, just to recap, that you'll notice that then mu is at 0.01, you have run root at minus 10, and one root at 10, and moreover, we've done better than that, we've gotten the next order approximation to it, we have minus 10 minus a half, and 10 minus a half, right? And the point is that you can get better and better approximations, and you can get uh, uh, better and better approximations, both in the sense that when mu gets smaller and smaller, it'll get closer and closer to your written approximation, but also you can go to more and more terms, and that means that you can approximate it for larger values of mu. This is the basic idea, okay? So in your problem set uh, question, uh, the, 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 this number three is just a question about Taylor series for, for um, a 2D functions, where this is a very straightforward question. I've just asked you to apply the formula, which uh, is in the chapter notes. And then there's a little question here about the analysis of a quartic problem, right? So now this is even higher. But the key is for you to remember that these techniques that I've shown you, you can use them not just for cubic and quartics, which you actually have a formula to. You have the cubic formula and the quartic formula, but nobody uses the quartic formula, really, because it's so long and convoluted. But you actually have no formula over a quintic. But the point is that this method allows you to develop approximations to equations that you don't have explicit formulae to, and that's why it's so fantastic. Okay, good. Let's go on, shall we? All right, so we've covered now to the end of chapter four. Um, chapter four is just this introduction to this methodology. Uh, there was only a simple example of the method of dominant balance, but we've covered a more difficult example with the cubic, and then in your homework you have the uh, practice example with the quartic. Let's go on. Let's now talk about local analysis of bifurcations, and now we're going to pull it back to um, dynamical systems. Okay, so uh, the basic idea of the next bit of the chapter is that we're going to look at general functions f of x and mu, and you want to study those general functions by expanding them into a series, and then we expand it into a series and study the behavior near a fixed point, and because we it's a lot easier to study the series expansion than it is to study the general function. The general function can be arbitrarily complicated. We'll be able to develop different um, types of bifurcations. Okay, so to begin with, I'm just going to remind you what a bifurcation is, uh, and then we're going to start doing some of this analysis. Okay, so let's remember two things. We're going to pull ourselves back to uh, equations of the form x equal to, sorry, equations of the form xn is equal to f of xn and mu if you like. Um, the first point here is a fixed point. x star is such that x star is equal to f, right? The reason why we study fixed points is because the point is that if you can hopefully understand the structure of the fixed points, then you can understand the structure of the dynamics uh, in general, right? It's the same reason why you study roots of, roots of polynomial, because if you understand those roots, um, you can say a lot about the polynomials themselves. Uh, the second thing that we found from our analysis of the logistic equation is that uh, a local bifurcation and let me uh, bifurcation is something that in this course we don't really define that carefully okay 
but for uh, our purposes, it'll be it's sufficient for you to understand that local bifurcation is a point mu is equal to mu naught. Let me um, not write this in brackets. I'm gonna write it as a hyphen. A local bifurcation is a point mu is equal to mu naught where the stability of uh, x star changes. Okay? And the criterion that we found just, we didn't do it rigorously, we just did it for the logistic equation. The criterion um, is that i.e. is where the magnitude of the derivative in x is equal to 1. Okay? And the basic idea of that was, was kind of like if you, if you have your dashed line here and the dashed line is sufficiently shallow, the intersection at the fixed point, this is your fixed point x star, is sufficiently shallow, then the orbits are stable. And when you do the cobweb diagrams, they should converge into the x star. But then when the gradient starts to increase, in particular, if the gradient is greater than the line x, or the gradient is greater than 1, sorry, then the orbits will eventually spiral out, and so you've gone from stable to unstable, okay? Alternatively, if the gradient is um, oriented at minus 1, like that, then what, has hap what eventually happens is that you can form a little box in the dynamic in the cobweb diagram and that box tells you that it has to be a two cycle right so you've gone from a configuration from unstable to unstable but with a two cycle in the middle okay let me i'm going to go into more detail on that uh, in a second so what we want to do then is we want to take this equation for f and then to write it in terms of a series approximation near the special point x star and near the special point mu naught. And then we want to analyze the dynamics of that simplified formulation. Okay? So, um, so the idea is, that, so the first thing you do is that you shift um, the coordinates such that x star is then sent to 0, and mu naught is sent to 0, okay? Because you're only interested in behavior near the fixed point, it doesn't really, it's not really helpful for you to work with x star in general, so why not just shift the coordinate system? So you send uh, eg, so I can make a new coordinate system, let me call it x hat, where x hat is x minus x naught, so that when x is x naught, x hat is at zero. And similarly, I can make a new coordinate for mu, so that this is the case. And then I can go and substitute this value of x hat and this value of mu hat into the original equation, sending all my special points to zero, and then I can just simply study the dynamics near zero, zero. So that's a lot easier. And that's what the theory in this chapter does. Okay? Um, so we may assume without loss of generality that x star is equal to 0 and mu naught is equal to 0. Our two special points of consideration where this thing happens is exactly at the origin. And then you can do the analysis there. And that just makes everything easier. OK? Good. So now the next step is let's take this f and let's expand it into a series uh, in, in powers of x and mu. This is the 2D Taylor series, right? So we know by 2D Taylor series Uh, that 
near x and mu equal to 0, 0. So instead of using x and y's, when I do my Taylor series, I'll use x's and mu's. Um, I can rewrite f of x mu as f of 0, 0. And uh, instead of using uh, a derivatives, fx and fy and fxx, or I'm just going to write it in terms of unknown coefficients. So in the notes, it's written as an a0 of x plus an a1 of mu. That's the, this will be, this a0 will be the gradient fx, and that will be the gradient f mu. And then the next ones go up in b's b naught x squared plus b1 x mu plus b2 mu squared. And for the theory in this chapter, we're going to need the third order ones as well. But we don't need all of them, really. Um, but I think I'll write out all of them. Actually, no, I'm not going to write out all of them, because I, I certainly won't need it today. So I'm just going to do that. And plus order, and in the notes, we wrote this as x to the 4. So it's basically any, um, I'll just do the same notation as in the notes. So the quartic order terms and so forth. There are different ways of uh, writing, there are different ways of writing this kind of notation when you want to refer to um, higher order terms. Sometimes people will write order x to the 4, mu to the 4 like this. And obviously, we have all the other combinations. So you have x cubed, mu, um, x squared, mu squared, and so forth. Anything in which the, the power is uh, summed to a 4 is not too important. Uh, so, so the question was asked of, is it an x star? I am not sure what I used in the notes. Mm -hmm. Actually, there's no need for me to conjecture that. Uh, I have, I use, for, for whatever reason, I think just for historical reasons, I use x star in the notes for the fixed point um, rather than x naught and mu naught for the bifurcation point. So here the special point is x star and mu naught um, and not x naught and mu naught. Okay. So we've expanded our uh, function into an approximation near that special point at the origin. And then we seek to solve. You want to basically understand what happens if you're near this point, but not exactly at it. Because you know exactly at it, you, you're at um, the fixed point exactly. You want to know what happens when you're slightly off of it. And you need to solve x equal to this problem here. Okay, so you want to put an x into the left hand side here. You want to solve the fixed point problem, but you know that x is equal to, sorry. You know that the fixed point is at x equal to 0 and at uh, f0, 0, 0 is equal to 0. So um, uh, sorry, this is f0, 0, 0 is equal to 0 is the fixed point. And you also know that at that location, by assumption, this a0 is either plus or minus 1, because the gradient is either plus or minus 1. And by assumption, this a0 is, which is equal to fx at 0, 0, is equal to plus or minus 1. Because you've assumed that it's a bifurcation, this was condition 2 in the list of two elements that we wrote out at the top. So this is, I've not written this part very well, this should say, 
we know that x equal to 0 is a fixed point and f of 0, 0 is equal to 0 at that fixed point. Okay, so therefore, you need to solve now whatever else remains. So you've got um, plus or minus x plus a1 mu, like this, plus all the other guff up here. And remember that all of these unknowns here, you actually know in practice, right? Because in practice, I've given you the function f, and you're able to take its derivatives and evaluate its derivatives at the origin at 0, 0. And so you know each of these values because you know the Taylor series coefficients. You can always work them out. But we don't need to worry about their values for now. We just write them out in general like this. OK? OK, so now the challenge is for you to solve this problem here. Right? You want to basically develop the solutions of this problem, and that's where you start to have to use some of this dominant balance stuff, because you can't solve this exactly. But you know that x and mu are small, and that's the trick. So you know that, for instance, the higher order terms here, because the assumption is that you're near 0, 0, x and mu are near 0, 0, then by assumption, all the higher order powers will go away. I realize just now that I, uh, you can't really see past this edge, but there's nothing re really written past this edge. It just says plus dot, dot, dot. So I know that all the quartic terms and all the quintic terms and so forth um, will be very small. And the question is, then, knowing that the progression of the powers gets smaller and smaller, can I at least approximate the solutions of this equation? Right? Well, it will kind of depend, my ability to approximate the solutions of this equation, it will kind of depend on whether these values take any special numbers. So for instance, if a1 is equal to 0, that might be very different from if a1 is not equal to 0. And if b0 is equal to 0, that might be very different from if b0 is uh, equal to 0. Okay? All right. So the way that you then proceed is that you classify an increasing complexity the different possibilities that you have going from essentially from left to right. Okay? So this, this yields two cases. We're going to call case A, firstly, the case where fx is equal to 1, i.e. a0 is equal to 1. So this is a plus one here. And then case b, which will be the subject of chapter 6, is fx equal to minus 1. And this is the period doubling case. So this is here is chapter 6, and this here is chapter 5. Those are the two cases for us to examine in turn. OK? All right. So then the next thing, so let's start with case A. And we're going to call it case A1. And in this case, what's going to result is what's called the saddle node bifurcation. And it's very easy. Okay. Oh, sorry. X is near zero. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I sh this 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 fellow shouldn't have been hanging around. So previously. Let me just make sure I didn't. Uh... OK, so I made a mistake here, which I forgot to ditch that one. So let me just cover the logic of where, because it's quite important, uh, my little gaffe here. So I had previously expanded. Uh, I had previously expanded this equation as follows.
And by assumption, we assume that a naught is either equal to plus or minus one. And this, this uh, includes all the quadratic terms and so forth. Okay, so uh, what you do then, sorry, I just realized it's quite confusing the way I've done it. So by assumption, f of zero, zero is equal to zero because you've assumed that's, that's one of your two assumptions from the get-go. So the two assumptions from the get-go is that f at the origin is zero because it's a fixed point, and also the second assumption is that the gradient is either plus or minus one. Okay, but you have to leave the x on the left hand side because the point is that you're going to be moving away very slightly from that fixed point. So the left x remains on the left hand side and I have this and this is a plus or minus a naught times x. I realize now why I was confused. So now on the assumption that this a naught is equal to 1 then you have x is equal to x, and you cancel the x's from either side, and now you have 0 is equal to a1 times mu plus so forth and so on. Let me write that out here. I realized I really bungled that explanation, so let me, uh, so hopefully that explanation, the, the, the second one that I did uh, was clear. Let me, let's try again just to make sure that you all understand and that I haven't screwed things up. Okay, let's try again. So this is the equation that you're attempting to study, and you're going to assume that f of 0, 0 is equal to 0. This is the fixed point condition at the origin. And you're also going to assume that the derivative at that point is equal to plus or minus 1. Okay? Then you go and expand this one here into a Taylor series around uh, 0, 0. And so this gives you x is equal to f0, 0, 0, 0 plus a0 times x. a0 here is the first derivative times x plus all the other stuff. Okay? This guy is 0, this guy is either plus or minus 1. In the event that this is plus 1, the two x's cancel on either sides, leading us with this equation. In the event that this is a minus 1, then go see chapter 6. Sorry, I screwed that explanation up, but I... Okay. So now we have the equation that we need to solve, and we want to solve it for values of x and mu. So this guy here, we want to solve for x and mu small. Okay? Now, the trick here is to basically think about the ordering of the terms, the ordering of the magnitude of the terms, and it's essentially a dominant balance argument. Now, as long as a1 is not equal to 0, then this guy has to be involved, because it's certainly the biggest one of the bunch, okay? This number 2 might be involved. Let's hang on to it for the moment. It's certainly the biggest one in x, right? And we won't need any x cubed and so forth. So as long as this b0 is not equal to 0, this one has to be involved. But this 3... This 3 scales with x and mu, and I know that mu is small, and I know that x is small. So necessarily, this 3 has to be smaller than this 1, because this 1 is just a mu, and this 3 is an x times a mu when x is small. 
And similarly, this 4 is a mu squared. And I know that mu is small, and therefore mu squared has to be smaller than mu. So the only conclusion that I have, and I need to have at least two terms to make the balance, because it would be unbalanced if it was just one term. I would conclude that the dominant balance has to come from those two terms, as long as a1 and b0 is not equal to 0. So if a1 is not equal to 0 and b0 is not equal to 0, then it makes sense for you to posit the following dominant balance. 1 will balance 2, and both of those will be much larger than 3, 4, 5, and so forth. That's the argument, you see? Now, if 1 balances 2, then this tells me that I have b naught x squared is then balancing. I move this one to the left-hand side, a minus a1 times mu, and I have an x balancing plus or minus the square root of minus a1 mu over b naught. Remember that these a naughts and b naughts are, in essence, numbers that you know. Given having specified the function f, you could go and figure out what those numbers are. And it depends on those numbers here will essentially determine the shape of the function. So someone had asked, why can't I, uh, someone had asked, why can't I balance 1 and 3 together? Well, 1, the point here is that 1 scales like mu. If I want to be specific, I'd say this is order mu. 1 scales like mu, but 3 scales like x times mu. And I know that mu is small, but I also know that x is small. So 3 has to necessarily be smaller than 1, right? So it can't be a 1 and 3 balance. Does that make sense now? Well, it sort of depends. 2 doesn't, 2 will always be small, of course, right? No, there's, every term is small, but you're kind of asking how small, right? So 2 will be small, but the, but, and it's unclear whether 2 and 3, just from looking, if I just look at 2 and 3, I can't claim to know which one is bigger. But I can certainly make the claim that 3 is smaller than 1. There's no doubt there. And I can certainly make the claim that 4 is smaller than 1. And I can make the claim that every other number past 4 is smaller than 1. And so the only other possibility to produce a balance is if 2 balances 1. So indeed, x, so indeed x squared, x is small, x squared is smaller than x. But there are no other x's in this problem. Let's go on. Let's, let, well, actually, no, let's not go on. What we're going to do is we're going to verify. We're going to, we're going to just clear up your question by looking at the answer, and then we'll figure out, does the answer make sense with the assumption that we made? OK? So let's look at the answer here. This answer tells you that x is order root mu. So x will be, as, as long as this quantity exists, of course, uh, the, the, you, need, you need this to be a uh, real value, so it would be real and negative. a1 over b0 needs to be negative, so then you get a positive square root, okay? So as long as this gets you a number, then you know that x looks a lot like a number times root mu, okay? So if x is a number times root mu, then x squared is order mu. And you see, that's the balance between 1 and 2. Also, if x is like root mu, then I know that x times mu is mu to the 3 halves, right? Because it's 1 plus a half. And mu to the 3 halves is then smaller than 2, and it's smaller than 1. So it's a consistent balance, you see? You can always check these things. And if you're unsure of it, if you're a scientist and you're unsure of does this work or not, you just put in a numerical code and you put in some numbers and you plot, you plot it for different values of mu and different values of x and you convince yourself that it does work. Okay, now this thing here, 
this thing here, we have to look at it a little bit more closely. What do you conclude from looking at this? Well, you would conclude that it depends on the value of a1 and b0, firstly, of whether this is, is positive or negative. But whatever the value of a1 and b0, this will always be, uh, this will always be a legitimate real valued square root on one side of mu. So if minus a1 over b0 is greater than 0, this exists for mu greater than 0. On the other hand, if minus a1 or b0 is less than 0, that's OK. And it exists for mu less than 0. So whatever the values of this, it'll, it's always going to exist on one side and not the other. That's the key conclusion. OK? Let me now plot the main picture. And then we'll just end the course, uh, end, end the class there. So we summarize the results of this analysis on the so-called bifurcation diagram. So you remember the bifurcation diagram looks like that. And on one axis I plot mu, and on the other axis I plot the fixed point x. And the key is that this is a, um, an example where on, let me take the example where minus a1 over b0 is greater than 0. So in that case, you know that there are no fixed points on the left, like that. But on the right, you have one arc here, which looks a lot like root of minus a1 over b0 times root of mu. That's the graph of root mu. And on the left, you have another arc. This is minus root of minus a1 over b0 times root mu. What, what this graph indicates is that when mu, if mu proceeds from negative to positive values, as you go from the negatives to the positives in your dynamical system, all of a sudden at mu is equal to zero, you end up introducing two fixed points. So you go from zero fixed points, here is zero fixed points, and here are two fixed points. I will draw a picture so that you kind of see what this looks like in terms of the cobweb diagrams uh, in a moment. Okay. If, if it's the case that this is a negative number, then it's just the opposite situation, that you have two fixed points on the left and zero fixed points on the right. Remember that this is a local analysis. You haven't made any conclusion about what the function is doing away from this special point. It's just an analysis near that special point. And before you go, let's kind of do our best to draw. We're going to do an exact... Just to nail down this concept on Monday, we're going to do a precise example, a precise numerical example, and you're going to see this bifurcation happen. This bifurcation is called the saddle node bifurcation. Um, but how do you see it happening you know, in terms of a graph? And I'll try my best to, to draw the picture. So I imagine a situation where, um, for instance, if mu is less than 0, I have this kind of picture here, like that. But then at mu, uh, when mu becomes greater than 0, I get that kind of picture there. So at mu equal to 0, what happens is that there's an intersection between this curve and the dashed line just with a gradient of 1. At every point after that, you've produced two fixed points on either side. So you've gone from a situation of 0 fixed points now to two fixed points. Yeah. So that's the, the reason why you plot the bifurcation diagram as we did. So in the bifurcation diagram, mu x here 
no fixed points on the left, one fixed point on the right, and another fixed point on the right when mu is greater than, greater than zero. Okay? That's the basic idea. Uh, I think this, this concept, if, if, if you find this a little bit confusing, this idea of relating the Coppola diagram to the bifurcation diagram, that's going to really crystallize when we, we go with a specific example. But the main, just, just to wrap up, the main idea of today's lecture was, first of all, understanding how you finish up with the method of dominant balance. How do you balance terms in order to solve these equations that you wouldn't necessarily be able to solve? And then secondly, how do you do the analysis near a fixed point by expanding it out into a series and then trying to do this local balance. And the basic idea of, of how we're going to do the later bifurcation theory is that you remember we wrote out that long series of approximations and we said under the simplest condition, you just balance this one here, this one term here with the two term there, we balance one and two, and everything is lower order. But if one of those uh, elements that we balance was actually equal to zero, then you have to go a little bit deeper into the series and a little bit deeper into the logic. And you say, I can't balance 1 and 2 anymore. I now need to balance, say, 1 and 3 or 1 and 4. And in that case, what does the picture look like in terms of the bifurcation diagram? That's the goal. You also won't have enough at the end of today's lecture to finish your problem set 1. So if you're interested in trying to do some of the problems um, over the weekend, then I would suggest you start on, uh, I, I would suggest that you start on your problem set number 2 three and four, you have enough to do that. Or you just might like, so this is Taylor's series of two variables and analysis of a singular quartic equation. Uh, or you might just like to wait until our Monday class. Um, and I, I'm hoping I, I have enough on Monday to allow you to finish up one and two. Okay, otherwise, um, have a good weekend and I'll see you when you get back on Monday.